I'd like to give you a warm a welcome to Linda Murphy. tonight did help and worked hard, not just help, but worked very hard in the campaign when I ran in 1994 against Sandy Garrett, an incumbent Democrat who was working with Bellman in the 1017 plans. I didn't know what all was in 1017 when it passed, and I don't think anybody did. In fact, I know they didn't, because uh, in 1992, in the fall, I was appointed to a committee in Fort Gibson as a parent, and I am a teacher. I've been certified 30 years by the State Department of Ed, have taught in the public schools, but I was at home with my newborn baby at the time and was appointed as a parent to a committee in Fort Gibson to write what is called the Comprehensive Local Education Plan. That was just a normal process that all schools did every couple of years, five years, something like that on a routine basis. So, you know, I'm not thinking that much about it. I'm going to do my civic duty, and as a teacher, was real interested in having a part. And as we said in the first meeting and then the second meeting, the new superintendent, who, uh, by the way, became a state senator later, Earl Garrison, <coughs> senator from Muskogee, Democrat, was a new superintendent that year. He came to us directly from the State Department of Education, where he had been an accreditation officer for a number of years. And Earl was a very friendly, nice, likable, personable person. And I always got along with him well. In fact, he, uh, even when he couldn't stand what I was doing politically, was always very nice and friendly. But uh, his sister sold uh, our house to us. My husband, Dan, is here on the camera tonight. By the way, thank you, Dan. And uh, his sister, Laura Young, sold us our house and told me at the time, we moved from Edmond to Fort Gibson, and Dan worked in Tulsa. My dad lived in uh, Tahlequah, was a pastor there uh, at a small country church. And uh, so we were getting closer to my dad and, you know, in a rural area that we wanted to be. And I was planning to go into optometry school because I worked with vision and learning development. Now this plugs in, if you hold on, I'll tell you how, in a real quick summary. Uh, vision and learning development has everything to do with students processing what they learn in the uh, classroom. Most of what they take in in the classroom is visual input. And as a special ed teacher I taught in public schools, I found that a lot of the students I had that were labeled as learning disabled had actual visual problems but they had 2020 eyesight. Now that sounds contradictory because we've been told 2020 is perfect vision. It isn't. So that's a whole other speech. I've given that one hundreds of times. I'll come back and give it someday if you want it. But today we're going to talk about what I was doing in Fort Gibson. I was a parent. I was planning to get mine. Uh, you know, you make your plans and then God has other plans. Have you ever noticed that? You know, I had some great plans. I was going to get my doctorate. I had worked for a doctor in Oklahoma City where we've returned now. We're in Edmond again since September. And I had a great career. I traveled around the United States. I spoke for a foundation out of Santa Ana, California that did research and education in the field of vision therapy. And I directed a clinic in Oklahoma City where I worked with children who had visually related learning problems. And by the way, in this campaign, I had a wonderful message from a former vision therapy student who could not read, hid under his bed, cried, felt like a failure in life, and his mother brought him into vision therapy, and I worked with that boy. He started reading, and his life turned around. He sent me a message the day after I filed and said, what is the maximum? I'm sending it to you. Tell me, tell me how much I can send. He said he is a businessman down in southern Oklahoma, very prosperous now. He couldn't read when he was 19 years old. So there's a little commercial for uh, BT. I don't do it anymore. I'm not getting paid for this. Okay, but that's what I did, and it was a wonderful career. But I was put on that committee by the local uh, elementary school principal, had a son in that building in that uh, school. We lived across the street. We thought we had the little picket fence, you know, community. Everything's wonderful. We lived in Heritage Park. And by the way, State Representative Tom Gann and his wife Debbie were our neighbors. 
They lived around the corner in Heritage Park. Our kids played soccer together. And Tom Gann was on the school board. His wife, Debbie, was the PTO leader. leader. Tom, for those who don't know, is now a state representative from Inola and standing strong in the battle. So Tom can tell you, and someday I'll show a video. <coughs> well, my husband may edit it down for us, and we can bear to watch that long. But uh, there were some amazing events that occurred in that community because Tom, first of all, was uh, riding uh, his mountain bike and drinking Perrier water, <laughs> playing one-on-one -on -one basketball with the superintendent. It, you know, everything was great. Well, this was Earl Garrison, and I liked Earl. He was fine, but when we started in these meetings, and Tom was in there too, Earl tells us we're going to have a radical change. He used the word radical. Bill Clinton had just been elected. <laughs> you get the rest of the story. We're almost on the Arkansas border over there, Fort Gibson. So we've got an awful lot of flow over of Bill Clinton into the community and the area. <coughs> it was eight to one Democrat mm -hmm. at the time. Now, my mother warned me about the area that it was going to be a little different in culture than I anticipated, but I had no idea what she was talking about. And my mother was a Democrat, but she was, at the time, she was a conservative Democrat, and later switched to Republican, in fact, to vote for Frank Lucas, who I went to high school with in Cheyenne, Oklahoma. So I'm from western Oklahoma, farmers, ranchers, a lot of them from Texas. My mother was born in Texas, uh, six generations down there in Texas. Uh, before statehood, a battle of San Jacinto, you know, we'll talk yeah, yeah. Texas history. But anyway, this is the farming ranching area that I was born in, in Cheyenne, and uh, <coughs> graduated high school there. And by the way, let me just tell you, I do have a website now. It's votelindamurphy.com, and on there is a little bit of history about me that uh, some of the people across the state that know me can plug into, you know, where I've met them and and know a little more about me. But back on the committee, the committee was given a task to put into place what was actually outcomes-based education. We weren't told what it was. We weren't told anything about it. We were just going to be writing our own, our very own, vision statement and mission statement. So we're creating it. In other words, this is going to come from the grassroots up and we're going to have our hands on it, our fingerprints on it, and sign off of, hi Shelly, how wonderful it is, how wonderful this new plan that we're going to reform, and he said radically reform, our schools. So he set my red, uh, red light on, and I started asking for uh, research. So I went to the principal and asked her, do you have research? Well, I just got this file of papers we got at the state uh, training that we had. So, I took that home, I started reading, and the man who coined the phrase outcome-based education, his name was Bill Spadey, Dr. William Spadey. And later in Oklahoma City, KFOR TV reporter Jana Davis was the one who went to Bill Spadey's home in Aurora, Colorado, and with her camera recorded him talking about things out in outer space and, you know, just far out, far out. He was what I call the space cadet. Not, no offense to uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, that's what they call it. Okay. I, I'm, I'm all for Jim. <laughs> but uh, William Spadey was from the Federal Department of Education Research Laboratory, called the laboratory, called the uh, Far West Laboratory, where he developed this system for outcomes-based education. And the bottom line is, as I researched it, as we continue to have our meetings, what it does, it flips the mission of public education from equal opportunity to learn to producing equal outcomes. Does that sound familiar? Equal outcomes. The results will be equal. Okay, so we did repeal OBE. When I ran for state superintendent in 1994, long story short, went all over the state for about a year and a half in meetings, a lot of grassroots connecting, talking to people, and the people of the state rose up and said, we don't want this. And that's what was in my heart, in our house in Fort Gibson, not knowing I was surrounded by eight to one Democrats, not even thinking about it, 
you know, it came to the point where I did file to run for state superintendent, and uh, it was not a happy place to be sometimes, and for my children, with certain union leaders in their classrooms and their teachers, it was not a happy place for them. There were some experiences I'll tell someday. I may write a book. So I know very well what the union does, and I also served in the Department of Labor with Brenda Renault. I was Deputy Commissioner of Labor. After I served in Governor Keating's office for a year, I went to the <coughs> Department of Labor where I served uh, with Brenda Renault over workforce education and training. And I was there because although we did repeal OBE when I ran and Governor Keating signed the bill and it was repealed, then I went to the Department of Labor. I was there because of school to work. And school to work came from the Clinton administration also, and it was to centralize control of workforce development. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce controlling all the way down to certify students for the jobs they get, and without a government certification, you would not get a job. That was the plan. Also, we had uh, books from the Department of Labor called the SCAN, Secretary's Commission on Achieving Necessary Skills, that were developed books, programs, for how to divide students into different categories according to their performance on testing. And the students that were going to be farmers or truck drivers or secretaries or executives would have different levels of education. They, would, they didn't need so much reading if they're going to do that. And it was like a predetermined system that students would fit somewhere in a category. There was even a resume made up as a sample for students to be used, and it was rating their honesty, 1 to 10. Honesty rated 1 to 10 by the school on a resume. Now, this is from our Federal Department of Labor. I'll just say it this way. Social engineers think they can determine what we need to do in our lives and how we can have a better life and manage it and control it. And that's what we've seen imposed on schools over and over. OBE, Common Core. Common Core, same thing. When it rose up, I'm like, I can't watch it. I can't sit back. I'm old. I have other things to do. But I can, I can stand up and have my part in this battle. Because I knew a lot of Republicans at the state capitol, and I knew that uh, the messages were not getting through to enough people there. And, and I knew that I had to go and talk to people I knew and say, look, this is what we did before. We don't want to do this again. New name, same game. Okay? And it's a philosophy shift. It's a paradigm shift from providing <coughs> opportunities for students to learn to the best of their individual ability. From that to we're going to make sure they all have the same outcomes and we're going to measure those outcomes and report them and we're going to hold them accountable to getting those outcomes. Even our George W. Bush, you know, God love him, but he put no child left behind him and it was awful. Even Republicans say that now. And at the time, I just went home for about seven years because I ran on that. I knew what it was. I knew what it was doing. And return or response to intervention, RTI, can be a good thing in the schools. It can be, but what happened, and I knew it would, it basically wiped out a whole lot of special education by saying, we're going to respond to every child. And that's where the behavioral, the attitude, the values, what we're calling in business the soft skills, do we think those things that are important? Well, heck, yes, they're important. But do we want the schools <coughs> teaching attitudes, values, beliefs? No. And that's what we had with OBE. That's what Common Core would have brought to the state of Oklahoma. Now, we, in, it, it brought it. It was in the law. But we did repeal the Common Core also in 2014. And that's a lot of why we needed to repeal it. It's a centralized control system. And uh, it's a matter of elitist determining what the curriculum will be, what the testing will be. And as Republicans, we want teachers to be accountable. We want schools to be accountable. I do too. I worked in a clinical setting where we got measurable results. We had research that documented those measurable results. And we didn't do experimental things, but what we're getting 
in the public schools over and over from the top down is mandates and control system programs and ideas that aren't going to work and then we're holding teachers accountable because they don't work and we're getting horrible scores I mean we've got some things that are just going on a, a merry-go-round that need to end and we've got good teachers I hope I don't embarrass or make someone feel badly but Susan Davis is here with us tonight a teacher from Tulsa and she is a, a good conservative Republican teacher. We do have Republican teachers. We have conservative teachers. And they're all over the state of Oklahoma. And not they're, all of them voted for, not all of them were at the Capitol saying, right. my pay either. Right, they weren't. And Susan did not go. She said, I'm not going. Well, I didn't think she would because I already knew Susan. And uh, I'll just say this. What we need to do is preserve the ground of our public school system that's there and where the good teachers are, let's not punish them. Let's sort it out and don't have these answers that are one size fits all and try to impose it down from the state or the federal level. We've seen the firestorm we have in uh, the state capitol for nine days. That's why I'm running because the door opened through the obvious lack of leadership of Joy Hoffmeister. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. That was obvious, and to a lot of people, and teachers, and even OEA members got sick of hearing the OEA leader. Can you believe that? I'm not, I'm not supporting and defending that they joined, but at one time I was an OEA member for a couple of years. I didn't know, just like I moved into H1 Democrat territory and had no idea until I became the Republican nominee for the state of Oklahoma. Uh, you know, then I found out. But um, what what we've got to do is have a, a vision of excellence in education. And it's never going to come from these federal controls and programs. Right now we have federal legislation, ESA, Every Student Succeeds Act, which was written by, in large, by Lamar Alexander, Republican. Now, he also said that uh, governors needed to go down to the hospital, to the nursery, and start taking note of, you know, the births and the... He, he's all for early childhood intervention by government to produce those results in the end, okay? We've got that in our state budget to some degree by the expansion of early childhood to a tune of millions and millions and millions of dollars that we didn't spend before that have expanded and expanded. I'm not saying there's no need ever anywhere for some children to have some earlier intervention, you know, through uh, public school programs. But we don't need to do this four-year-old, three-year-old, two-year-old, when? When do we stop? Where are we going here? Do you remember one of the Democrats with Clinton said we needed to have residential public schools? Yes. Yeah. And, uh, so, we have to step back, look at the philosophy, look at the big picture, and see that we need to fight together for local control of public schools. We need education excellence. That's our desire, that's our goal, and many teachers want that too. And they didn't say it because you couldn't hear anybody's voice except, I think her name was Alicia Priest. Yeah, I didn't forget. <laughs> I didn't forget. That lady held the mic for, what, nine days? almost and she even got the other unions and other organizations mad at did you know there were charter school teachers at this at the state capitol too i mean we had a real mixed bag up there so we've got to sort this out and and not punish those who are out there wanting to teach the children that are going to be in a public school and i'm not against the charters that we have except we've got some problems with a few we've got the Good Lawn Schools, are you familiar with the connections there nationally? Just start looking up Good Lawn Schools, the Dove Academy and others. I mean, this is nationally reported. This is not something I'm just finding on my own and telling you. 60 Minutes did an uh, interview with Good Lawn, and he has a movement. Uh, it's tied to the Turkish government. Uh, Erdogan, the president, and Gulan have been in battles for years politically. So the United States gets drug into that, and some of our public charter schools get drug into that. We need to look at what we're doing with some of the charters. We've got to look at the whole picture. In fact, our state auditor audited 
the Gulan schools, the, the ones tied to Gulan in Oklahoma, and found $2 million, <coughs> Gary Jones, $2 million misappropriated into their own foundation of state taxpayer money. So we've got, to, we've got to be real honest and look at the whole picture and local control, education excellence, academic standards, not touchy-feely, not behavioral goals for all students. Okay, on that, academic standards. I wrote individualized education plans and then I was a consultant in uh, schools for students that I had in vision therapy that had visual interferences to learning. So writing IEPs, individualized education plans. Some of those students had behavioral plans. Why? Because they were throwing a desk across the room. Because they were melting down in the middle of the cafeteria because they were hurting themselves or others. So there is a place for behavioral intervention, but it needs to be with parental consent and not to the whole population so that we keep behavioral problems under control. So there is a way to deal with all of this, and uh, I just want you to know that uh, Susan is going to be working in this eastern part of the state as a point person to coordinate for the campaign. And uh, if I might, Stephen Moore is working with us also, and Stephen's going to be certified uh, as a teacher, but he has a real strong background in conservative politics in Washington, D.C., so he knows what's going on and really appreciate him. We've got a lot of good teachers, a lot of good administrators that are eager to see a change. And I'm told by some of them, you put your name on the ballot and you're in because we're tired of joy. It's not joyful anymore. <laughs> okay. Local control, education excellence, academic standards, return the money to the classroom, learn. Yes. That's yes. what I'm telling return the money to the classroom. There is a problem in some classrooms, obviously. We heard a lot of it on national TV. Now, some of that concern and complaint and the far out reporting we heard was about local money that they're not getting. You know, like uh, the building. The building's falling down, you know, the rain's coming in, there's mold, there's termites. I heard some of those stories. Okay, that's bonds. That's local funds. That's not state budget. Okay, and as we know, the state budget is uh, earmarked a lot of it so that our legislators don't even have full control. Hopper can tell us that and, and others here that have experienced trying to deal with that process where you don't have control of 100% of the money. So that local control, returning the funds into the classroom is going to require local people to see what they're doing with their local money return that money to the classroom and then now now is the end learn now now because the timing is right we have a door of opportunity that opened that is unique i did not plan to run i've had people ask me people ask me in 2014 and i'm like i can't see it she's getting too big of a base well we know how she got a really big support <laughs> base now don't we uh, an affidavit was filed by the DA in Oklahoma County yep. against uh, Joy Hoffmeister and others that were involved. Without naming names, you can read it, but I'll say I'm running against her, so I'll name Joy Hoffmeister. Yep. $160,000, $160,000 came from OEA directly to a dark campaign fund to benefit Joy Hoffmeister's yep. race. Yep. Then we see Nine days of the OEA, the same people holding the mic. Yes. How does that happen in our state capital? Where is our education voice to counter mm -hmm. that radical element that was there in building? I saw a socialist table, socialism yeah. table set up with books on it. Now, you know, I've walked to the state fair and walked through it before. I won't claim that everybody in the state fair and I agreed on everything. So I think that's kind of like what it was at the state capitol. Capital. I know teachers that went that called me. Well, I'm up here, but I don't know that we can do any good. Do you? I said, well, you're going to have to learn, but I will just tell you that I've been working with legislators this year, and they've been trying to get money, trying to you know work up a race because we've all supported that statewide. 
And I said, uh, the OEA was not in there helping with the school land fund bill. I worked on that a lot, and that school land fund money is education money. It belongs to no agency, no other entity but education. So how can we have $2.4 sitting in a fund while education needs money, and it's education money. Now, I'm not talking about touching the trust. The trust is permanent, <coughs> cannot be touched. However, they're not putting the revenue out to the schools to distribute the revenue, and that's what the Constitution says. More than half of the revenue last year was kept and evidently rolled back into the trust. So there are things, there are people, there are many people across the state that want to see this change. It runs our state, it ruins our state, and we want our children educated. Even if our children don't go to a public school, and you don't think you want your child there, I understand you choose to homeschool, you go to private school. But we've got some wonderful opportunities for people in certain areas of the state right now with public ed because these people didn't want Common Core. They didn't want OBE, and a lot of them supported me. I know them. You know, I went to college with a lot of these teachers. But I'm not saying it's everybody. We just have to sort it out. And we have to know, we have to know that there is a real radical element that will come in and control public ed if Republicans aren't focused on preserving what's there to make it the best it can be. We've got a lot to drive out and a lot to clean up. Let's start in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Superintendent gives salary $374,000 package. $374,000. Well, there's more because there is health care and there is retirement on top of that. Maybe even more than that. But I know three seventy four dollars is in the Tulsa world. Broke down. That's true. Also, said 5000 support and administrative staff. 5000 less than half that number of teachers. So why would we have 5,000 support and administrative and because she brought in layers and levels of administrators to control the system for her new reforms. She's trained by the Broad Foundation. Look it up. It looks like Broad, but it's Broad. B-R-O-A-D Foundation. She is also from Aspen Institute. She was the state superintendent in Rhode Island before she came here. A reporter called me from Rhode Island and asked me, you know, about her getting this job because they were running her out of the state, basically, the, the teachers. <laughs> so let's work together that those have goodwill and want the same kind of education that most of Oklahomans want, and let's drive out the outside influences. Thank you. Thanks.